Uh, so we have four sections to this talk. Section number one, what is concourse? Uh, section number two, what are the benefits of concourse? Why would I use it? Section number three, we're going to go through a few scenarios and talk about how concourse can actually help a development team who's in that situation. And then section number four is where we are actually going to do some live coding. Uh, we're hoping that by the end of this talk, uh, we will have all together built an actual working pipeline. So here we go. What is Concourse? OK, so Concourse is um, an open source CI. Um, and you use it for, obviously, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Um, you actually probably have seen it around the office. It's on the monitors around Cloud Foundry. Um, and that's what we're going to go into. Yeah. Um, so why should you use it? Or some features about it that are pretty cool. One, your pipeline actually looks like a pipeline, which I think is like just a huge benefit. Um, so you can project this on a board. And obviously, you can already tell that there's like color coding going on. Um, this like communicates information super easily to a lot of people. So not just within your own team, but also to other teams. Um, so for instance, within your own team, if somebody's transitioning onto the project and they're new, they can easily understand what the pipeline is like to get to something like a release. So what are the different environments and um, environments that you're deploying? What tests are you running? Um, what are the inputs and outputs? And then for other teams, it helps to understand if a certain team's like world is on fire. Like if things are red, if they can't actually like cut a release because their tests are failing, you can like have a s s an understanding of their state of the world. Um, and then also for the PM, it's really easy to cut releases. So there can be like a ship it job that they just go in and they like click on a button and then they run it and then that should generate like a GitHub release with tags and notes and things like that depending on how you have configured it to do that. So it gives them a lot of control and they can know really easily whether it's possible for them to cut a release with something that's green and working. Yeah, and we'll actually get to see some of these UI niceties in action when we mm -hmm. build our pipeline later. Um, the other thing too that's pretty cool is that it's obviously all written in code so there's no like um, configuration UI kind of thing. Um, and this gives you a lot of benefits, so you have source control. So the same thing that you have with your code, you, or at least with like your project, you would have with your pipeline. So you can have commit messages and history. You can go back to something. You can understand why something changed and potentially what caused something to break. And I think that that's obviously like all the benefits that you see in your own project you could see with your pipeline configuration. Um, another thing is that it can undergo the same things that we do when we actually like build our own tool. So you have code review. Here we do it through pairing, but maybe your team does it a different way. Um, and then it's not just one person writing something or configuring something and, and knowing exactly how something works. Um, you have pairs. You have different people working on it via stories or whatnot. Um, everybody sees it. Everybody can review it and like approve the patterns and things like that. Um, and then finally, um, some teams have actually test driven their pipeline, which I think is pretty cool. All right. So talking about some situations that development teams might find themselves in and whether Concourse can help them. So let's say that this person is the PM for a small company. They have four devs and they're building an iOS app and they're consuming something like, you know, like a, a SoundCloud API or something like that. Um, even in this situation where it's just their product and it's not like they have multiple teams, you know, all four of these developers can talk to each other all the time, there's still probably going to be a part of their deployment process where, you know, they have their local unit tests where they're doing most of their development. They're not necessarily talking to that third-party API. Then they want to have some other test suite that really makes sure everything is all good and it's going to talk, have some tests that talk to the real API. Uh, Concourse is great for this kind of thing. Uh, you can have your pipeline that does all of your local stuff and then have the next part of the pipeline that hits uh, the third party integration and make sure that that's all healthy. And then the last part of your pipeline can just be the deployments itself. Next scenario. Uh, this one's going to sound familiar to a lot of people here. Uh, we build both the front end and back, back end of our web app, and we host it on AWS or GCP or what have you. Uh, here's another great situation where, you know, this is what continuous integration is built for. We want to make sure that the team that's building the front end and the team that's building the back end, uh, when we bring them their stuff together, that it's all going to be copacetic and it's going to actually be a product that works. Uh, the pipeline, the way Concourse grooves you into building your CI such that it's a pipeline, uh, this is pretty much its wheelhouse. Last scenario, uh, CIs and build pipelines are for nerds. Um, 
I can't help you, man, sorry. <laughs> All right, so a lot of the times, uh, a lot of the places I see concourse around here is uh, particularly in like the CF area. So Jen, does that mean that, uh, that you know, Golang is the best, is the best stuff for no. this? No, you can actually write, uh, it can be any programming language, um, whatever your tool is in, um, you can have it work here. Okay, okay, cool. So I can write in any language. But like everyone here uses GitHub, so that's probably like, that's the only place that I can really like source. source Absolutely stuff not. ICI, you can right? also do like Amazon, <laughs> like, like S3 buckets or different things you can pull your inputs from. Okay, cool. So what about CF? Do I need to be using CF to leverage no, the advantages? No, you do not need a Cloud Foundry installation. Cool. And then, okay, so when I want to actually like install it, oopsie. I revealed no. that answer a little bit. Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you do not need to use Bosch. So I could I could deploy this without Bosch. Yes. Okay. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about what the deployment options are here. So we're gonna there's a list of four. We start basically with local and simple and quick, and we kind of go out to like more complex. Uh, first one is the one that we're gonna try to do a little bit later today, which is just a local vagrant VM. Uh, you can spin this up in literal minutes on your box, and you can immediately start hacking away on a real concourse. Number two is a Docker file, which uh, the Concourse website has, uh, has directions for how to do this. And this would actually let you relatively easily get a working instance up on some cloud somewhere. Number three is, uh, I think the slides ate my vowels. Do you know what this is, this BBL thing? This is Bubble, um, ignore him. Um, so this is actually created and supported, by, or was created and supported by a team here um, by Cloud Foundry. Um, it helps create the infrastructure for um, actually deploying it. <laughs> so what, what clouds can I deploy to right now with Bubble? Um, AWS, but I think GCP support should be coming in the next few days or something. <laughs> <laughs> Writing checks for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of GCP, uh, the, way that, uh, the way that before Bubble has this GCP tool out there, the way that you could do that is you could actually deploy the concourse binaries themselves on GCP or AWS. Um, this one is a little more difficult. It requires you to basically hook up all the firewalling and stuff like that for you, which that's why we listed it, we listed it this way. We think that uh, when you're first starting out with Concourse, maybe start with number one or two or three before you go on to number four. All right. Um, so now we've kind of gone over what Concourse is and a little bit about what the advantages are for you. Let's actually start to try to build a pipeline here. Um, so. Going back to our deployment options, again, we're gonna try to use number one because that's the simplest thing to do. And let's actually get it going. So when you're using Vagrant, uh, these are the two commands that you need to use to get it up and running. So I cheated a little bit and ooh, that's super tiny. Can everybody see that okay? One more. That better? Three more. Three more. All right, here we go. So you can see I cheated a little bit and I ran, for the sake of time, I ran the commands beforehand and, uh, is that better, Joe? Okay, sweet. Uh, like I said, I cheated a little bit and I ran the commands before, beforehand to just save us a little bit of time. Uh, we have our uh, Vagrant up and running and we can actually hit our concourse right here. So bam, um, it, it takes about probably about 10 minutes to do those two steps that I just listed. And we actually have a concourse up and running here. Mm -hmm. No pipelines configured yet. So let's uh, move on to number two, which is installing the Fly CLI. Now, Jen, what is this Fly CLI and why would I want to use it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so in order to like uh, configure something or to actually test something out, you can actually use Fly to execute commands against um, that target, so we'll actually target light, which is um, our concourse, um, and we're going to add, we're going to set a pipeline. Yep. Here. So Fly, Fly is a tool here, I've already got it installed, but the way it's that you... It's available there. Yeah, exactly. It's available right on the concourse that you, uh, that you get up and running. So you just move this thing into your path, and uh, you're good to go. So uh, yeah, let's log in with that command right there. So we're going to log in with light dash T or dash C. I actually have to point it to my concourse URL. Oopsie poopsie. I didn't realize it was going to do that. 
All right, so we are now authenticated uh, through the Fly CLI with our concourse instance that we have over here. So let's actually start to build some tasks. Uh, so we'll, we'll go over in a second uh, at a high level what a task is on concourse. Uh, but let's take a look at one of the YAML files that describes a task. So what I have pulled down here is a an, an really simple API uh, that we wrote uh, for the purposes of this demo. Uh, and it has in it a task called concourse.test.yaml. So we're going to focus on this for now, this run step. Uh, it basically just is where you can define some work that you want this task to do. Uh, keep this in mind. Uh, we're going to go and look at some illustrations real quick of what a task is. So Jen? OK, so you're going to, um, in your task, you're going to define the work to do. So this, um, if you were paying very, very close attention to the previous slide, um, it would be like a script that runs um, tests, for instance. And so what are, gonna, what are your inputs and what are the outputs to this test? So ideally, if you're running a task to run tests, you would have input being like your development repository or like a branch called develop in your repository. And then the outputs would be um, potentially that exact SHA or um, that repository so that you can pass that on to the next step. Okay. And so any input, any output from that task. Right. So here we have some illustrations. So we have a container here, uh, which every single task in Concourse runs in its own container, which uh, for people who are not familiar with what containers are, I don't consider myself an expert in them, but uh, basically a container is just a sandbox environment that gets spun up on your machine or on whatever machine the Concourse, uh, con the worker is, the worker is hosted on. And it just uses some of your existing operating system's resources and builds a little sandbox for your work to run in, isolated from everything else. You can think of it as a much lighter virtual machine. Mm -hmm. Cool. So like Jen said, we have inputs that go into the task. And then out of that, we get some outputs, which this task makes candy, like all software should. OK, so let's, uh, let's go back over here to the code and talk about each of these parts. So again, we want some work to do. So that's what this is. This run step points you to the script that actually is going to do the work. I need my container to have the Linux platform and the actual image that I'm going to use because my script, or excuse me, because my project is going, uh, I'm just going to go over the wire and I'm going to get a Docker image that's all up or loaded up and ready to go. So that's the definition of just like the work and what I need uh, to do it. Here are my inputs. And this will make sense in a second. But just sort of take for granted at this point that this is pointing to a GitHub repository that gets pulled down before the, the task actually gets run. And then here's where I define the outputs, which this actually just tells Concourse to create uh, this folder on the container, and then this folder becomes available. Anything that goes into this folder at the end of the, ta at the, end of the task is available to later tasks. Okay, so that is, that is the definition of a task, but we actually want to put it into a pipeline. Mm -hmm. So step four is we want to use this task that we're looking at here and actually put it into a pipeline. And this is where the rubber is going to meet the road. So let's take a look at a pipeline. OK. We'll do something similar. We'll, we'll go to illustrations in a sec, but just you'll see right here, we have a reference to that concourse.test.yaml file, which is this task definition that we have over here. So Jen, do you want to go pipelines? Oh, yeah. So you can actually take, um, so because there's like a shared kind of file system here, the output of, or the candy can be used as an input to um, another task or something else in like a job, let's say. Um, so let's say your test pass and then you want to deploy a new environment with um, the current code or whatever input you have. Um, and then there's going to be a new output, which is flowers. I didn't pick any of these pictures, by the way. And then after the <laughs> that output can be used in a combination with other inputs in another um, task, another container, um, and gives you puppies. <laughs> yeah. So. Um so each of, these, each of these phases are what are called jobs in Concourse in a pipeline. And a job, 
it's, it's not quite a one-to-one -one with a task. A job can have many different tasks inside of it. Uh, for our example today, it happens to be one-to-one. -one. Each job only has one task. Uh, doesn't necessarily need to be that way. All right, so let's take a look and talk about our pipeline configuration here. So we actually have the task defined in here. We call that task test. And then here's, here's that, that part earlier where I said take for granted that this is pointing to a GitHub repository. This is where we can actually see that connection. So as part of this plan, I have a get, this OMG fruit API master, and up here is where that's actually defined. It's defined as what's called a resource. And so this is what I was referring to earlier in that the type of your resource can be anything. It doesn't like, it can be um, a timer, it can be an S3 bucket on Amazon, um, it can be anything. And so we, we ha there's a bunch of available types that are supported with Concourse that you can put here. And then you can also have, so you notice how there's like a branch that's say in your repository, you can have like a develop branch um, that's like a completely separate resource that you pull from to run your tests, and then you can actually push to um, a master branch if you wanted to like put something else there. Yep, totally. Okay, so let's actually use this pipeline. So I'm going to use the fly CLI to, pull, to, to push up to our local concourse instance here. Fly-t, and I tell it light. Set. And then I do set pipeline. I name my pipeline. And then I give it the configuration file, which that's the thing that we were just looking at right here. So Fly is asking me, hey, uh, just a gut check, uh, you're adding this resource. You're adding this job. Is that what you want to do? And we say yes to that. And now we have some directions here. If we come over to our pipeline over here, bam, there it is. So this is our input, and that's your job. Mm -hmm. So uh, because we just created this pipeline fresh, uh, it's in a state called paused, which means that like, if I were to, if I had a trigger set up to have this whole pipeline run, say when I updated my code on GitHub, uh, that would not work right it now. It would just be pending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you can actually unpause your pipeline. Yep, totally. Well, let's go ahead and run this thing. So I, sorry, let me back up one sec. So I clicked into the, ta or the job itself, and a plus button is how I can schedule a build on it. So there's lots of things that you can do with Fly that um, can, so you don't even have to really interact with the UI, let's say, but this is actually really convenient for, let's say, a PM. If this job was called Ship It, they can just go in, click on it, and then press plus. Still? Is it? Oh, bummer. <coughs> oh. Okay, so imagine they it's going green. We're doing this. <laughs> yeah, imagine this entire demo working. <laughs> oh, ha. perfect. Maybe. Well, it's actually this. This is the part where it's trying to go and get the GitHub. Yeah, my not sure. Um. Oh, it did. It. Perfect. All right. They heard we were doing this presentation and they got it together. <laughs> perfect. Uh, so let's actually jump back. This thing is running right now. It's great because it has, this is the first time this job is ever actually running. Uh, usually this will be some other color, like green, ideally. Uh, but we have some nice gold uh, trimming <laughs> happening right now to let you know that this thing is actually actively running. Uh, so let's explain what's happening right here uh, by going back over to the script. If you remember, we said that we needed a Docker image with Golang loaded up on it. Uh, in order to actually do the work that we're doing in the task. So that's what it's doing right now. Uh, it, it's pretty cool that, um, and I don't, don't know all the details of it, but I know enough to say that like, when we run this in the future, in the future runs of this demo, uh, it won't have to do all this work again. The concourse will actually look and say, oh, hey, I have a Docker image that's Golang with the 1.6 tag. I'm just going to go ahead and use that thing from the cache. What's that? Maybe. Is it Docker that does that? It's cool. Uh, cool. So that's actually Garden doing that. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so we have a little bit, of, little bit of dead time here. Are there any questions about what, what's happened so far? Adrian. 
Yeah, so uh, you mentioned this Docker container. So why do you have to pull down a Docker container? What does that give you in a pipeline? You mean the Docker image? Yeah. Okay, so that's for the, like, that's the, um, the Docker image will have the support that you need in terms of like OS programs libraries in order to actually execute like tasks or jobs um, within a container. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, the so the, the the reason the reason that I, I p ended up pulling that down is I tried to pull down an even an even lighter image for it to run on, uh, and it didn't have Go, which I happen to need for my situation. So but for Jenkins, what you're saying is that you don't need to actually specify um, the file system. But then with Jenkins, if you wanted to test against different versions of Go or different versions of Ruby, you'd have to install all of them simultaneously, right? Okay, right. so with this, you can actually specifically specify for each configuration versus actually bringing everything down in order to have them available to your Jenkins um, tests or jobs. Containers here are provided isolation. You can save everything you want other platforms. So you know that your test is going to run inside the container, and if they die or if they break something, it's going to contain inside the container. So can we completely characterize these jobs? Can we characterize this as a user that affects the first control, which won't affect the user that won't control? Yeah. I think that even in even in Jenkins, there there is complexity. It, it really just depends on what you're doing, right? Like yeah. there are advantages to doing each of them. I bet. Cool. So we went green, which is great. Uh, I would have been scared if we didn't, <laughs> considering I cooked the books here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so we can actually look to see after it successfully pulled down the Docker image, then it started executing that script. Uh, and in that script, I just did the basic things that you that you want to do. I pulled down all the dependencies that my that my code base that my code base has, and then Ginkgo is. Uh, is the testing framework that you that you that you can use in Go? It's really good. I love it. Uh, and so that actually just executes the tests. There are only three, and they all passed. So, hip hip hooray. Okay. So, this is great. We have like a super simple pipeline. It's doing one job. It's just running some tests. But we actually want to get to the point where we're deploying something, right? Or we ha give ourselves the ability to build and deploy something. So, let's go do that. So we have another, another pipeline configuration on here. This one is a little bit more complex. Uh, so um, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Uh, I'll try to do my best to explain as simply as possible. So the parts that you'll recognize are from the old pipeline configuration are, here's our resource that goes to our GitHub repository. And then here's that task that we just wrote to run the tests. Now let's talk about the other things that are here. Here is our second resource, which is uh, called a GitHub release resource. That uh, it, it basically does all the work of creating a re resource, or excuse me, a GitHub release for you. Um, then let's go to the second job in our pipeline, which I called ship it. Uh, I'm kind of cheating here for the purposes of this demo. I'm not actually shipping it anywhere, but uh, just saying like this is where we would ship. But the things that I want to focus on are we get our other resource that actually does the, the uh, release for us. And this thing, this job only runs conditional on the API test job passing. Cool. So this configuration here that you see for the task is like inline, but it's possible to have written that as like something that would be available yes. to pass. Yes, that's right. That's yeah, right. so this we've actually like in, inlined the configuration, so what you expect for your image and what you're trying to run. And so right now we're just running some echo command. But um, yeah, thank you for pointing that this out. This is, you can also extract it to something that's available as a file that you can execute. Cool. Matt. Can you show some documentation for this? Because I would forget how to do this. Is there like a website where I can get it? Yes. Yes, there is. 
uh, course.ci, and it has a documentation section. Yeah, if you go to like pipelines. Pipelines. Yeah, here. So these are like your different resources. There's a number of them, so you can see like S3, and then your jobs. If you scroll a little bit even more. Yeah, so these are different um, jobs and different configurations for them. Um, and there's like a bunch of other things that we're not touching upon um, that are kind of cool and that you can you will most likely use um, like aggregate, which does a bunch of things at the same time. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, right. There, there's so much here that when you start, when you start really going into it, like you'll see how powerful it is. Mm -hmm. um, our goal with this demo is basically to just show you like. You know, we have some, we're running tests and we're giving ourselves the ability to deploy and we're doing it all in like the span of like 30 minutes. <clears throat> okay, so let's actually use this thing. Sorry, are there any other questions? I thought I saw another hand up in addition to Matt's. Dan? That would run, good question. It would, I think it would end up running like within the container itself. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. So everything that Compress does is in containers. Yeah. yeah. So all of the resources, those are actually like containers. Mm hmm. At no point can you ever Yeah. Yeah. Cool. You want to? This wouldn't necessarily be on your production server. This would be running on workers that spun up specifically to run. You as an operator are going to spin up a machine that runs Concourse. Concourse is going to spin up containers for you to run your user. Well, what you can do here is you can create a container. After the test of passing, you create a container and then you can put the container into production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cool. Any other questions? Okay. Let's set this thing. Set pipeline, full dash pipeline. Again, it's asking me, hey, uh, do you want to add this resource? Do you want to change this job this way? And do you want to add this new job? And to that, we say yes. All right, let's go look at our handiwork. And bam, we have something that looks a little bit more like a pipeline here. So let's come over here and let's kick this thing off again. And this thing will run for a bit. <coughs> Wanted to say that, uh, so going back, if we may go back a sec to this right over here. So I had alluded to the fact that like number four is, is relatively difficult. Um, it's, it's just that you have to, there's a lot more complexity that you, have to, that you have to understand about the way concourse really is operating, how all of the components talk to each other. Uh, when I was first like, playing around with concourse and trying to understand it, I did option number one, and that let me try to understand inputs and try to understand tasks and see how this thing actually can be used. Uh, I moved on to try to do number four, and it, it was challenging, for sure. Uh, but what was 
really awesome is that when I finally got number four done, I had it up on GCP and it was working, I pushed or I, I used all those scripts that I had written to run against the local Vagrant box and I put them up on GCP on the concourse that I had gotten going and they worked the first time, which was amazing. Uh, that is not something that I necessarily expected given my experience with you know, other, other tools. Usually there's something that like, is particular about the environment that I go to that was different from my local environments. And it was, you know, <laughs> after toiling away for, you know, many, many hours of it, I had set some bit over here that had, you know, downstream effects that I didn't have locally. None of that happened at all. I did it and it worked the first time. So uh, that was really the moment where I was just like, yes, this concourse tool is super powerful. The fact that you can just jump in in like 15 minutes, start doing stuff locally, see if it makes sense for your project, and then have the confidence that it's going to work like that when it actually goes to prod and it's in a real, or excuse me, when it actually goes out over the cloud and some place that your team can use it effectively, it's great. Let's go back to see how we're doing. Woo, it worked. So uh, our test ran. If Let's you actually. go back, actually, so um, I'm not sure if you guys noticed it earlier, but we actually manually clicked off the API test, and that's because there's like these like dash lines, so it's not automatically triggering it. You have to go in and do it yourself. Mm -hmm. But this whole step happened on its own because of like the solid lines, so it's man it's like um, automating going through that process. So every time the tests run, you cut a new release, and then it ships it. That's a really important detail. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, so we can jump back into our API test. We can see that we ran. Um, we actually did all that work. And then we hit our ship it, and we, well, you know, shipped it. And we can actually go back over to uh, our repository page here. And we can see that, uh, that we had four releases. Now we have five releases. Um, yeah. That's, that's, our, uh, that's our simple little pipeline that we built together today. Uh, obviously, there was a whole lot of stuff like the YAML files were, were pre-written and everything. Um, and then there's just the fact that uh, there's just sort of, sort of that little curve of trying to learn how it all works. But really, uh, once you're comfortable with the concepts, it is pretty simple to get a relatively useful pipeline uh, up and running quickly. So That's it. All right, there. Questions? Questions, Aaron. I have a question. Yes. Um, how would you get it to build automatically whenever I commit? Oh, you would, oh, sorry. No, really, really good question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you could just add to your pipeline something, a field called trigger true, and then it'll just make sure that every time you commit, the tests go off. Is it trigger on the source? Um, no, it's a trigger in the um, job. Oh, no, actually. Uh, oh. oh, on the resource. Oh, yeah, sorry. It would be up here. Hey, Adrian. Yeah. Yeah. So I noticed that you mixed in your access token directly into this pipeline. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's available, Jen? Um, I know the answer is yes. Right. Variables. Uh, if you go back to that. If you, yeah, if you try to run it, is that pipeline? You might have to do T light. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. And then what do I do? Help like that? Okay, so you can load variables from a file. I should have known that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, yeah. so you're saying there's some uh, interpolation syntax? Yes. Lines? Parentheses. <laughs> <laughs> Is that document? Is it in the documentation? Sweet. Read the documentation, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> I'll check it out. <laughs> cool. Gabe. <laughs> I'll authenticate, what are your authentication uh -huh. options? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so so yeah, that's, that's a great question. So when we did it, we just kind of popped in here and I was just kind of like, uh, yeah, log in. 
yeah, sure. And here we go, right, I saw everything. Not very great authentication. Uh, so you do have authentication options. You can configure your concourse to use basic auth uh, or GitHub authentication. And I, are there any other ones that you can use? Those are the two that I'm familiar with. There you go. Supports any OAuth provider. Yeah. Community-driven and supported. Dirk. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, who could who could he ask to find that out? I think it's the latter. I, I, I've heard of, uh, I think that there's like a team in London, London that, that does it, yeah. right? Yeah. So the fly execute command, can you talk, tell us about what that is? Yeah, that would, so fly execute. Fly execute would let you, so it, w it would allow me to make a quick change to like my concourse.test.yaml. Oh, well, swap file. Get out of here. Perfect. Uh, it would let me. It would let me test a change right here. Uh, just real quick, like let's say I wanted to like try a different version of GoLang, like 1.7 or something. I could change it here real quick, and even though I check this file in, I could actually try that change out using uh, using this command fly execute. You can test things without actually having committed them. Yeah, basically, a fly execute just lets you execute a command, or excuse me, execute a task just independently using the concourse instance that you have, which is cool. So like Travis, for instance, like I, I use Travis for, uh, in a couple places and whenever something goes wrong on my Travis, like when OS X gets updated, I have to go, ha I have commits in my, in my GitHub repository that are basically just like, try to fix this Travis er issue I'm having that I can't figure out right now. So. Uh, the yeah. nice thing about Fly is that it takes all that away, and yeah. you can just test stuff locally. Yeah, you don't have like push fail, push fail, push succeed, or something like that. You can actually yeah. test it and then commit it, and then yep, have it work. Hey, Adrian. If you're trying to debug a script, is there any way to get onto a container and try it out? Like SSHing onto a container with a ton of I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you can SSH onto a container after you <laughs> How do you do that? Is that through fly? Yeah, so uh, if you do fly hijack dash dash help. Do you have to target? Right. Yeah, so the real one is like a hair step, but the, so the alias hijack. Ah. Uh. Yeah, so then uh, you can actually jump onto a container that's previously ran and SSH onto it. And, wow. Uh, actually cool. I did not know that. Uh -huh. Thank you for that information. You guys have a second installment on this Yes. A lot of questions if you want to leave. 
So we talked, to, we talked a little bit about methods over here, deployment options. Uh, we've done number one. We're hoping to talk a little bit more about some of the other ones. Um, make, that, make this a more useful thing where people can actually go take, take the stuff from this talk, go try it themselves if they want to. And then we can talk a little bit about what it looks like to actually deploy this thing in a proper place. I think yeah. so, yes. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. <laughs>